So yes, yeah, so, so the meeting is being recorded. So um, and it will be available on the website after the meeting. So uh, before we start, I'd just like to acknowledge that uh, we're joining this event online from our own location. But I'd like to acknowledge that we are meeting on the lands of the Wurundjeri people and the Bunurong people of the Southeast Kulin Nations. And I would like to pay my respects to the elders past, present and emerging and to all First Nations communities joining us today. So thanks everyone for joining us. Um, I hope everyone's going well. Um, so it, it's good that we're still meeting on Zoom. <laughs> it is uh, fortuitous. So uh, tonight we have a really special guest. Uh, I'd like to introduce Sarah Spencer from, uh, Sarah is um, the designer maker and artist from Heart of Pluto. So Sarah is uh, an engineer, a computer engineer, I think. Um, and uh, yeah, I'm getting a nod. And um, Sarah has um, done some amazing work um, creating, um, one, what I think is the most famous um, tapestry. It's uh, it's at least 10 meters square uh, and it's a 15 kilo tapestry of the entire night sky. Uh, so um, a couple of months ago, I was very privileged in seeing this in real life. And if I wasn't already a fangirl of Sarah's, I completely was <laughs> after I saw it, it's just, it is the most amazing piece. It just uh, absolutely blows you away. And um, yeah, I, I was literally rendered speechless. So yeah, and um, so I'm really excited that Sarah is um, speaking tonight uh, about her work. Um, now, uh, I just uh, want to make it clear the relationship between Sarah and I. So, uh, and this is just for transparency sake. So um, uh, I purchased uh, one of Sarah's products um, a couple of months ago, and um, uh, and I'm also a patron of Sarah. So there is a financial um, uh, arrangement between Sarah and I, but um, there's no conflict of interest because neither of us are benefiting from the arrangement. So I'd just like to make that clear, and I'm happy to answer any questions. So. Um, we're all okay. I can hand over to Sarah. Nice one. Thanks, Saskia. Uh, I'm so glad that you've been in touch over the last couple of years because this, uh, I, I have been meaning to come and talk to you all for ever since 2018. So it, it has been a long time coming and I'm really grateful to be here um, with all of you tonight. Um, so thank you so much, um, Saskia. It's, uh, it's been really great. So I'll just uh, share my screen. Thank you. It's our pleasure. <laughs> Okay, hopefully you can all see that. And I'm just going to uh, increase my window so I can see you all as well. Nice. All right, so Initiative Visible Universe. Um, I, I did just want to get a, a quick show of hands. A, lo a lot of you have turned your cameras off and, that, and that's totally fine. But I, I was wondering how many um, people here did actually see uh, or ha has seen um, this, this photo before um, Siskia first mentioned it a few weeks back. Um, is this, have you seen this piece at all? I'm getting a few, a few shakes of the head. Uh, that's No, that's fine, that's totally fine. Um, because it, it did go viral on Twitter and then there was, oh, I'm getting some, some yep, yep, some waves, fantastic. Um, so it did go viral on Twitter and it, and it did, um, uh, there was a few uh, uh, articles written about it. So it's, it, yeah, I'm never really sure exactly how much people have heard or read or versus how much I should be talking about. So that's all right. Um, the Knit Invisible Universe. Uh, right, so I just wanted to uh, spend uh, just a, a, a about 20 minutes or so um, talking about why I created it, um, where it's been, what it's about, um, and, and how it was made. Um, I wanted to talk about the fact that it's knitted. So um, if you can appreciate that in this photo, there's a picture of me off to the right-hand side, uh, so you can get a, a vague sense of the scale of the thing. As, as uh, Sisakia mentioned, it's about 10 metres squared, something like that. Um, and uh, but yeah, there's there's a lot more to the knitting than than um, two two needles, and uh, yeah, I also want to uh, do a quick explanation about what's happening next. Uh, so, right, the why, <laughs> why this giant 
Um, knitted uh, tapestry of the night sky, what's going on here? So I, I did want to introduce you to a conference um, which is uh, called EMF Camp. It's held by annually, say every two years uh, in the UK. And this conference is incredible. It, it, it's essentially a, a mixture between a music festival and a tech conference where um, thousands, I, I think the last event that they held, which was 2018, um, held, had about uh, over 5,000 uh, delegates join. And it, essentially everyone, comes into this field uh, and, and, and camps over a long weekend. Uh, and um, there's, it's a tech conference in the sense that there are, there are talks. So in the, in the two big top tens, the blue one and the red one that you can see on screen, uh, there, there are talks going on all, all day long uh, and, and some uh, movies shown late at night. I think Hackers was, uh, was, was quite, quite uh, popular uh, at, at the last event. Uh, but it, it's also a festival in the sense that you, know, you, you, you come here for the talks and for the organised events, but a lot of the great thing about a festival like this is the stuff that isn't planned. You know, you, you'll pitch a tent and you'll get to know your neighbours and, and all of your neighbours have brought along everything they've been working on as well. So uh, to, to give you a sense of the, the tech component to this, uh, the, the, the organisers dug their own trenches and brought fibre to the campsite, so fibre internet connection to to the campsite, uh, they um, designed their own mobile, the, the mobile phone reception here was just terrible. There's like no mobile phone reception. So they designed their own mobile phone network. Uh, and in fact, the conference badge itself, which you might not be able to see too clearly. Um, this is actually a mobile phone that they made written in, um, uh, in uh, uh, MicroPython and you can actually hack it and modify it and make it do different things. But, uh, and you know, the, I don't actually, actually have the, the battery itself is, not charged right now, so I don't have it on, but it was, you know, people walking around, but you get one of these uh, when, you, when you first sign up and you can call people and, uh, and, 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 you know, hack into their mobile phones, which is just completely wild. Um, uh, one of the times I was there uh, in, uh, in, a, in, a, um, uh, in a tent not far from my own, there was a, something called a bar bolt where uh, the Nottingham Hackspace members had designed a um, drinks mixer. So it was, it was a, you know, putting a, a glass on a conveyor belt and the conveyor belt was going up and down between the different drinks and it was creating these interesting mixed drinks. Um, there's other curious things like wind powered land crawling sculptures and hacky soapbox races. And uh, uh, I think in 2018, I even got to hitch a lift with, uh, inside a giant hexapod robot, which is made by um, um, Matt Denton, who also invented the BB-8 for Star Wars 7, which is just amazing, like mind-blowing things. So given the context of, of all this incredible tech and, 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 and uh, amalgamation of blinds, I really wanted to bring to this conference, the, the, this one held in 2018, I wanted to bring to my own um, influence, my own, um, my own project. So I, I wanted to, you know, I'm, I'm not smart enough to make a bar board. I, I, I'm certainly not smart enough to make, make BB-8 or a giant you know, walking spider, but I wanted to use my own enthusiasm for tech and knitting and create my own piece. So I was thinking about it and, I, and you know, knowing that this is a whole bunch of, of geeks coming to a, a campground and camping over a weekend, I thought, well, what better way to inspire and engage other people than by showing them a, a bit of science that's all around them. Uh, and, and particularly when a lot of these delegates are coming from the cities uh, all over Europe, uh, you know, and we're going to be here in a, in a field for a weekend. Well, what better way than by showing them the stars? Um, so that's kind of where the original idea came from. I wanted it, I want it to be like a, a big knitted tapestry that people could, you know, see and, and get engaged with the stars and that would hopefully inspire them to actually go out and look at them themselves. Uh, so in, in, in particular, I wanted this to be something that children would really engage with. So they might see a couple of the constellations that they're familiar with, but maybe lots of others that they're not. Because uh, this event really is for families and yeah, there's um, a lot of, uh, like there's a, a children's track and everything as well. So I wanted to make something that was really inspiring. Uh, so I've been working on this for most of 2018. So I started with the idea back in, I think, January 2018. And I was kind of toying with what I would do with this exactly. Uh, and it was months of work. So yeah, after you've been looking at this thing for about six months, you know, pieces of it slowly being built, um, like just creating the, the, the graphic uh, that, that was um, then, then knitted, just creating the graphic itself. I was working every single lunchtime, uh, yeah, every, every spare moment that I had for months. Um, and then when it was finally cut up into pieces so I could start knitting it, it was, I was knitting them into panels. And so this thing was sort of building, building a bit slowly over a long period of time. So after a while, I just kind of get used to having it lying around. You don't really think that this is a, a, you know, anything of any importance or relevance. And, you know, I just wanted to take it to this festival and just, you know, engage a few young minds in, uh, in um, astronomy. 
So it, it, it wasn't finished until like literally days before I was due to leave um, for, for the UK. And uh, so this, is, this photo was actually the first one where I finally, I, I put um, my, my son, son down for a nap and then I just, I, I, I pushed his toys out uh, just to the side and, and, and I laid it out for the first time in its entirety. I took a quick photo and I posted it to Twitter and, and on Twitter I said, um, uh, after 15 kilograms of wool and over hundred hours of knitting, I'm finally ready to fly to the UK. Now I just need to pack the entire universe into my suitcase. I'll see you all soon. And that went viral. That's never happened to me before. I've never experienced anything like that. And if, if you ever go viral in Australia, it's the strangest feeling because um, a lot of the, the Western world uh, are awake when we're asleep. So a, a lot of this, a lot of the retweeting, the comments and, the, and, and everything was going on whilst I was asleep. So I'd wake up to hundreds of emails and, and, and comments and everything just on the, you know, the first thing in the morning. Um, and you can't keep up with it. Like it's, I just don't have enough hours in the day because I was still going to work and I, I was still trying to you know, get everything ready to leave for this conference. And you know, I had a giant knitted universe, but I hadn't even packed my own stuff. Um, and, uh, and also bearing in mind the, the universe took, took an entire suitcase and I only really had my carry on in a suitcase to take with me to the UK. So I was I only, I, could, I, you know, I could, had to be really efficient with what I had in my carry on because that's all I really had. Um, but uh, yeah, I didn't want to spend too much time on this, but it really was quite mind blowing um, how well this was received. I had intended for the piece to be in inspirational, but I didn't, I hadn't even gotten to the conference yet. I didn't even imagine it would be so well received. So that was incredible. Uh, and over the course of the conference and the, and the following few weeks, uh, it kept getting picked up by a few different news outlets, particularly online. So. Whilst I was at the conference, computer file, Hackaday and space.com were all in touch, uh, which, which is incredible. Um, and then, yeah, over, over the next few months, it just kind of kept bubbling in a few different spheres. Um, so a, a lot of, th this conference is in the UK, but um, a lot of the, um, the media outlets that were picking it up were actually in the, in the US. And normally they, they don't even, you don't even hear about EMF camp. It's, you know, it's just completely different parts of the world, but it really seems to just be picked up by the entire international community, which is just astonishing. Um, Physics World and the Magpie, they were both um, physical magazines, so it, it didn't just go viral on the internet, it also went into print as well, which is just completely mind-blowing. Um, so I wanted to take a closer look at this piece now. Um, this, still, this still is the best photo I have because it's really, it's, it's actually quite hard to photograph. Um, uh, you know, when, when you're standing in front of it, you get this like this um, warped angle of it. So. Um, this is uh, sort of the, the best photo I've actually got. Uh, but uh, yeah, looking at it a little bit closer. So um, oh, clearly you see here that we've got all ADA constellations, um, both in the Northern and Southern hemispheres. Uh, ADA constellations, but 89 are actually labeled. And I think there's probably a, a few, smart, few smart cookies amongst you who could probably figure out why there's ADA constellations, but 89 labels. Um, and uh, you know, clearly we, we have here the Milky Way, which is running through, through the center that that's like gray, um, uh, wobbly uh, 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 gray cloud, I want to say. And then we've got the equatorial line. That's the way, the white way running through the middle. Uh, we've got all the planets uh, pictured. Uh, even though my, my handle is hard of Pluto, we don't have Pluto in here because <laughs> it's, it's not technically a planet anymore, but uh, we've also got the sun and the moon. So obviously the positions of each of these planets as well as the positions of the sun and the moon is, uh, is um, giving us an actual date and time and, uh, and I first figured this out when I was first putting the graphic together, uh, the date and, and time was, was calculated back in January 2018, which gave me a very hard deadline that I had to hit, which, uh, which is the date and time of the tapestry, which is uh, a UK time, 6pm, 28th of August. So that's the actual time that I got to the EMF campgrounds and I went straight to the spot where it's supposed to be installed and, and I managed to install it, I think about 10 minutes before uh, the, uh, the planets aligned in the tapestry. So that was... Uh, <laughs> That was a relief. <laughs> it, was, it was quite a hard deadline and, and I did actually meet that one. Um, so obviously the downside to having a, um, a map of this kind in the, in the rectangle view is that uh, the, um, the constellations which are in the, uh, the poles, like particularly um, Octans and Ursa Major, uh, they are really 
um, distorted or warped because they're being stretched across. I mean, normally in the night sky, it would be a spherical view, but in, um, you know, in this map, it is, it is um, a rectangle. So they're being quite badly distorted. So that is a downside to, to the shape that I end up making this. And, I, and you know, looking back at it again, if I was to do this again, I'll probably make it you know, in, that, um, in that circular um, shape that so it would be uh, less distorted. Uh, so this taking um, what is essentially 100% Australian made product to the UK, and, and I say 100% made in Australia because the wool that I, that I sourced was um, uh, from Bendigo Woolen Mills, so 100% Australian wool, and I made it when I was in Melbourne, so 100% Australian made, went, went from Bendigo Woolen Mills straight to my home, and then it was knitted until it was done. So I was quite proud of that. And uh, you know, it, despite um, all the uh, constellations being labelled with their Latin names, I gave one constellation uh, its Latin name and its uh, and its English name as well. So you might uh, you might take a wild guess as to which constellation that might be to honour Australia and taking this to to the UK. Uh, that is um, uh, the Crux or Southern Cross, which is in this map. It's down in it's down in the bottom right hand corner. Um, sitting there in the Milky Way. So that one's been given the Southern Cross label in honour of uh, being an Australian made product. I was pretty proud of that. Um, so I've also got here the link so uh, of um, the resource that I used to create the map. So en.hoshifuru.jp. So it was a Japanese um, map that I, uh, or, or a Japanese resource I used to create the map mostly because they, they gave me a Creative Commons with uh, an attribution license. But I, I did also want to mention that the map has changed a lot since the version that I sourced from their website. Um, and it changed a lot because uh, all of the lines, it, well, the whole thing had to, had to essentially be redrawn. I can't use a vector to send uh, or to, to knit from. Um, and, and I'll get into the details a, a bit more in, in just a minute. But I couldn't use the vector that they provided. I had to create a, um, a bitmap image that was of exactly the right scale. Uh, to fit into the into a knitted piece. Uh, and also I, I end up changing all of the lines that were drawn around um, each of the stars in each constellation, largely because in, in Japanese they draw the lines slightly differently. I think perhaps the constellations have slightly different meanings for them. Uh, so I went back and, and redrew the lines that uh, were kind of made a little bit more sense for more of a Western audience. Uh, and also I had to go back and redo the labels. So um, to do the, the knitting that I do, I've actually um, created a, a special font that works best for, um, for being reproduced in, in a knitted fabric. So I had to go back and redo all the labels as well. Um, and also they mentioned, now, now they mention it, uh, we've got this magnification data down the bottom of the map, which is showing um, all the stars, so the size of the stars are based on the magnification on, at that particular date and time. And, and I have realized that I'm um, doing a bit more research today and, and the magnifications of the stars do keep changing. So uh, this map really is set to a particular date and time and won't necessarily be relevant in 100 years from now. But um, uh, yeah, just when I was creating the graphic, all of the stars had to be readjusted so that um, the very specific shape of the knitting for each star for each magnification really did correspond correctly to each star in the night sky because it was being converted from the vector. Right, so uh, that's, the, uh, that's the tapestry itself. Does anyone have any questions on the actual uh, tapestry at this stage? No, quite. Very good. Okay. So next, I did want to just quickly talk about it's knitting, Jim, but not as we know it. Uh, so I, um, <laughs> yeah, we got, we got some people appreciating that reference. <laughs> um, so I didn't, so I knitted it, yes, but I didn't use knitting needles. However, it is still knitting. And, and this is where I'm going to uh, possibly blow a few minds um, because I, you, <laughs> I love this baby. He's so cute. Um, so I used something called a domestic knitting machine from the 1980s. And I, I did just want to um, do a call out. Maybe people can raise their hands. Uh, how many people have actually seen a domestic knitting machine, one of these old, older knitting machines from pre-90s era? Yeah, yeah, a few hands. Okay, great. Yep, excellent. Yeah, so we've got a few people who have at least seen these old knitting machines. Um, but uh, for a younger audience, it, it does tend to be like, you know, old tech that just nobody seems to have anymore, or it's been sitting under grandma's bed for so long that yeah, everyone forgot that it even existed. Um, and so for younger audiences can be quite um, mind blowing. So this is just a really quick graphic of um, what these knitting machines look like. So it's essentially a bed of needles. 
uh, that sits on a, on a table and you have a carriage that holds the yarn and the carriage passes over these bed of needles. And there's a lot of needles. So when you think of, uh, you know, two knitting needles, there's, there's like two of them. And then you have the, the yarn on, on one needle and you pass it across the, to the other needle and that's how you knit. Um, but with these old domestic knitting machines, they, there's one needle per knit. And that's where it gets a little bit mind blowing. So each needle is holding a different line or knitted line in, in the fabric. Um, and, a, and a typical domestic knitting machine will have about 200 needles, which you know, is, is a lot of moving parts right there. So as you, as you pass the carriage over this bed of needles holding the yarn, I've got this little animated graphic here that you can see those needles are essentially moving in, in and out of the, of the gate pegs. And as the needles move in, they actually draw the yarn into create a knit and then they move out again. So it can actually be quite quick to produce a knitted fabric because it, you're not just creating one knit at a time. It's actually a fluid, almost like a fluid motion, creating multiple knits as you go. So um, yeah, it is actually a lot of fun to, to work with. And, and as you as you knit, the, the fabric actually sort of drops underneath the machine, excuse me, usually just held on by weights. Um, so I say this, I say that I used a machine, but it's it's not that simple. Uh, and I just, just want, wanted to show a quick video by the lovely Lorna Watt, who's using an, an a old domestic knitting machine to create uh, an intaggio pattern. And I did just want to stress that although it's a machine, a lot of it is a lot of hand manipulation. There's a lot of work involved when using one of these old knitting machines. Um, so it's, it, it is quite involved. You have to sit with the machine and you have to work with it. Uh, and you have to, you know, um, keep, keep uh, in, uh, interacting with it. it. In a sense, it's like a sewing machine uh, in that you're, you're sitting there and you're working with the machine to produce something. And that's why it's considered a hand craft. Even though you're using a machine, it's still considered a hand craft. Right, so it looks really complicated. Uh, and I wanted to make a ridiculously huge, gigantic knitted thing using this highly complicated, uh, you know, machine to do it. Um, so... I, I did uh, have to, in order to produce something so big and, and, and have it be so accurate on such a large scale with no errors, uh, I did actually go through and make my life just a little bit easy by hacking the knitting machine. So the first part of the hack, uh, I was, was absolutely standing on the, on the shoulders of giants here. Um, uh, a group called Adafruit uh, had uh, worked out how to talk to an old um, knitting machine, specifically the, the Brother 950i. Well, no, sorry. They worked out how to talk, talk to a Brother 930, which is a 16-bit machine, and I worked out how to convert their Python code into a 32-bit translation, which worked with my Brother 950i. So I, I, I managed to find a way to essentially um, use the old floppy drive port on a 1980s knitting machine and worked out how to convert a graphic image into a knitting pattern, then convert it into a floppy drive format to pass it onto this knitting machine that um, so that it could understand it and knit out a, a graphic image essentially. So it it was definitely I, I learned a lot in this whole process. I learned Python, I learned how the difference between 16 bit, bit and 32 bit and all this other stuff. So it, it was definitely involved um, just doing just doing that. But um, the the real downside to this this part of the work was that it only did two colors. It didn't do three or more. So this was um this is back in uh, 2013 when I first started mucking around with these old machines. And it took a few years. I've been, I was pondering on the problem and I, and I, you know, went off on maternity leave and had a kid in the meantime as well. So it wasn't, you know, my number one priority, but um, I, I had been thinking about how to get multicolor working properly on the old knitting machines. Cause I wanted, I wanted something that was big of, on a large scale um, with a lot of detail. So these old knitting machines did kind of work nicely. So we've got, this version of, um, of multicolor, which is using a technique called double jacquard. It's uh, this number one it is essentially what anyone could always do uh, right when the machines were you know, being produced. It, it's you know, how people, something that people were always able to do is using um, double height and a double width method. They could get multicolor working, but at, at a poorer resolution. So if I wanted to make a giant star map using um, this resolution here on the far left, it would have had to be double the size um, to get the same detail. Uh, and it just, it, yeah, logically just wasn't going away. I mean, the thing was already huge as it is at the current detail that it is. And imagine having to do that double again. So uh, that, that wasn't working very well for me, but I, I did sit down and have a lot, of, I did do a lot of thinking around, around this problem. And I worked out that it's actually an algorithm problem. 
anyone who's done knitting before will fully appreciate that um, knitting is programming. If you ever if you've ever had to translate you know, a, um, a knitting pattern into uh, the physical form, it is absolutely programming that you're working with. Um, and a, a good friend of mine, Chris Howard, has a has a great talk on YouTube to that effect. Uh, she um, which is which is actually got two talks. One is um, uh, knitting is programming, and um, and the other one is um, knit one com compute one. Both are really great talks. I do highly recommend if you're interested in this sort of stuff. Uh, do do look into it because there's, there's a lot of programming involved. But um, so I, I did have to rethink those algorithms. So I came up with three alternative algorithms, which you can see here. Number two is the offset method, three is blank, and fourth is divot. So no one had ever done anything like this. So this old machines have been sitting around since the 1980s. Oh, mine had been, and but um, you know these knitting machines have been around for even longer. I think the first ones were you know circa 1950s, uh, fully mechanical ones. So you know these machines have been around a long time, and no one had actually you know, thought through these problems quite to this detail, trying to work with the limitations of a domestic knitting machine, specifically when, when you've got, you know, the, the color changer on one side and you have to go up the knitting machine and back in order to change colors. So you have to do two passes um, and, uh, uh, yeah, and, and using double jack cards, you've actually got two, two beds of needles, one for the back and one for the front. I won't go into too much detail, but, um, yeah, it, these are whole new algorithms that, that no one had actually conceived of before. So the one that I was quite fond of and the one that I actually ended up using for the star map was this, this second one here called the offset method. So the scientist in me, I, I kind of suspected that would probably be the best one, but a scientist in me wanted to actually go through and do implement all these algorithms, see you know, what the output was and then, you know, um, decide based on, on uh, evidence. Right, um, and there was a few more hacks involved in it. it. It was a little while still before 2018 came around. So I was trying to modify the machine and automate a few things. Uh, the color changer specifically was, um, and, you know, I, I could ded dedicate a whole talk to this, uh, you know, all by its own itself, but here on screen, you can see here an a automatic color changer, which enables the needing to be a lot more reliable. So instead of doing it manually, you could, um, the, the color changing is automatic. Um, so that's something that my husband, John actually designed for me. So originally you had to, manually change the colors and and here's a, an automatic piece instead which is sitting just to the um, left side of the machine um yeah and just a quick video so if you remember lorna what was had to work really closely with the machine to manipulate which is exactly how these machines were originally designed um once i uh, and in this video i'm um, i'm actually just doing a scarf so it's, a, it's not i'm not using all of the needles on the needle bed so just a little narrow scarf piece but once i set mine up and i've got it going and, I, and i've got the i've got a, um, the pattern programmed in and i've got the automate color changer i've also got a robot arm which is doing the backwards and forwards motions for me i actually could just walk away from the machine for periods of time I could go get a coffee or you know go to the toilet if i wanted to like I, I could actually just kind of leave it for a little bit um except occasionally i had to come back and move those weights you know how i mentioned that the knitting under machine is actually held on by weight. So I did actually come back. So as the, as the knitting is progressing underneath the machine, the weights themselves holding it down had to be, had to be moved. Um, but yeah, there was definitely a lot of programming and hacking involved with the machine to modify it. So it's even capable to produce this, the star map itself. So um, yeah, good fun. Uh, oh yes, and uh, I've done lots of other things aside from the star map as well. So I did just want to, um, and, and I thought you guys might appreciate uh, these other two pieces that I've done previously. So for um, the, the Geelong Scar Festival in 2017, they had the theme galaxies, which was just like, yes, that sounds awesome. Uh, and uh, and these, well, these are my two entries for that. Um, so on the, uh, on the left, we have uh, Tessellator Rockets, MC Escher, style, uh, MC Escher style. And on the left, we've got um, uh, actually a, um, a, a, a knitted night sky. So I, so I actually took a photo that someone um, someone made of, um, of the Milky Way um, photo across the night sky, and I, I trans translated that into three colours, um, one for the space dust, one for the background colour, and then one for the stars and, and the planets in the sky, um, and made, it, made that into a scarf. So um, that was a lot of fun. So that was actually, technically, that was actually my first uh, knitted galaxy. All right. So what's next? Um, here we go, another geeky reference. I dream of electric sheep. Speaking of uh, um, Aries constellation, <laughs> the, the Ram constellation. Um, right, so after the EMF camp finished, it was, I mean, it was mind blowing, it was amazing, and it was wonderful to be able to, you know, um, it inspire so many uh, incredible people. But um, yeah, by, by the time I brought the tapestry back home, it was just sort of sitting in a, in a suitcase. And 
and that was it. And I, and, and I thought, well, it's, it's not doing anyone any good just sitting in the suitcase. What a, what, what a waste. And the whole point of it was to inspire, particularly young children, inspire them to go out and look at the night sky. So I thought, well, it, 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 no one in Australia has ever really seen this. It, I, I kind of, I made it. And then two days later, I took it straight out to the UK and, and that was that. So it, it almost didn't really seem fair to, to um, not um, you know, give children in Australia an opportunity to see it as well. Um, so it was a bit of a process. I, I did spend a couple of years trying to find a permanent home for it. And, um, and I have finally found a permanent home for it, which is amazing. Um, so there's an exhibition space in the Melbourne CBD who um, have decided they want to uh, use it as a centrepiece for an exhibition um, that will be in March 2022, which is incredible. Um, so yeah, we've been, we've been, I've been working really closely with the space and, and they, they do sound pretty amazing. And after the exhibition, they do uh, the conservation team are really keen to put a plan together so that it's preserved for 100 years, which is just amazing. So the exhibition will be running for um, a full year and access will be free um, and they'll be in the Melbourne CBD. So you will be able to see it. Uh, so when I went to the UK, it, um, it, you know, it was just the knitted layer itself, but um, the exhibition space has given me the opportunity to actually finish it. And my original intention was to light up every, um, every star in a constellation. So by the time you see it in March, 2022, it will be interactive. Um, and that's it. That's quite a yarn. And just remember, we're knitting on a planet that's evolving and revolving around 300 miles an hour. <laughs> Any questions? Thank you, Sarah. That was amazing. You're welcome. I think I think we're all um, <laughs> just blown away. Um, there's one question from. Uh, Maria and Peter, uh, what happens if the machine comes across a join in the wall? Oh, it depends on the size of the join. Um, so if it's uh, a really big join, like someone's actually tied the two um, threads together, then uh, sometimes it can cause a jam and the machine doesn't like it, it can't actually move. Uh, but um, most of the time, especially with the yarn that I use, because it's it's made by um, you know by a, a large um, mill, they they do a special kind of join. I can't remember the name of it. But they essentially weave the two ends together, so it's it's almost seamless, and it's something that can be fed through a knitting machine without any problems. The bigger problem is when the yarn runs out, and then you know when the um, when there's nothing left on the yarn and it goes through the knitting machine, then what happens when the the machine is knitting without yarn in it? then the knitting actually just drops off the machine. It just goes and it, it's all broken. Um, so that's, that's a bit more devastating when there's no yarn. Yeah, yeah and I think uh, Joe has said that's a Russian join. Yes, that's it. Yeah. Thank you, Joe. Yeah. Yes, yeah. hold on. Yeah. <laughs> I had a question. Of course. Um, well, firstly, I just wanted to say that that's just fantastic. Um, I'm a knitter myself, and my mum had one of the old um, machine knits, you know, that you do by... Oh, amazing, a, a mechanical one. Yep. Yeah, yep. yeah. Um, but what I wanted to ask you was, um, how do you intend to light up the stars at the exhibition? Oh, OK. Um, I, I, I could spend another half, another half hour talking about that. <laughs> yes, do. Please, please do. <laughs> um, well, I, I, I do have some photos here of a prototype that I put together um, for, for the conservation team to approve of. So um, I, I can actually just um, show those to you. Let's see. Um, and let's see if I can. Aha, yep, yeah, okay. Um, cool, I'm just, I'm, I've got, multiple screens running at once. So I'm just trying to get the right stuff onto the right screen for you so I can share. Here we go. Right, Oop. okay, you see that? Um, so that's the prototype. Um, so I needed to get approval from the conservation team on materials because they, they need to make it last for a hundred years. So I need to make it out of something that's of some good quality. Um, so here we have, um, the front of the prototype, and, and I chose for the prototype. I chose um, this particular part of the night sky because it has a lot going on. It's got the it's got the Milky Way, it's got the um, equatorial line, it's got two planets, and it's got three constellations. So oh, and a seam. So um, 
so when I made the original tapestry, it, it was done in seven panels and they were all stitched together by hand. So you know, managing those seams was, was just definitely, definitely something I need to consider when I was creating the, the LED, um, LED layer. Um, so that, that's why there's a seam in this one. So that's the front. So the tapestry itself is actually just attached. Well, in the prototype, it's attached using some Velcro, but the conservation team have um, much better solutions for how to attach the two layers together, which is good. Um, the middle layer, which is here, so directly underneath um, the fabric of the tapestry, um, there can't be too much rubbing up against the tapestry itself, so this had to be quite a, a simple layer. Um, and zooming in, here we have um, uh, light, uh, light wells, which is just plastic poking through. So all of the electronics is actually in the back of this extra layer, and it's, it's all done using a, a cotton fabric, which is just stretched over a canvas. Um, so uh, we've got these eyelets. So um, so the, the, these white bits, these eyelets. So if you can imagine like you pair of sneakers, when you're, when you're threading your sneakers in the morning and you've got your, your shoelaces running through your sneakers, it's the eyelet that, you're, that your shoelace is running through. So the eyelet is actually the thing that's, that's protecting the, the open hole of the, of, of the fabric. And then through these eyelets, I've got the, just these light wells, these bits of plastic poking through. And these plastic um, pieces actually poke through the hole, through to the knitting and poke through to the front. And that's what gives the LEDs a really sharp pinprick of light through the knitting because the whole light is being directed through a plastic um, clear perspex. So that's the, the front and then the electronics are here in the back. So um, I, I'm using these uh, little LEDs. So, that, so they do red, green, blue um, and, and, and a variable um, luminosity too. Uh, and these LEDs, uh, they just come as like little circles and I have to cut, custom solder each LED into, into place. So the, so the lengths of wire between each LED, so six solder points per LED, three, three, um, three going in and three going out for each LED. Uh, so um, yeah, so there's gonna be somewhere in the, in the final piece, it's gonna be somewhere between 800 to um, 1,000 um, uh, stars, which will be lighting up. So there's gonna be over somewhere between 800 to 1,000 LEDs in the piece and each one will be custom soldered um, and it's, it's essentially the traveling salesman problem. So, um, so if anyone's familiar with that, it, it's essentially um, finding the shortest distance between each destination and still getting to every single destination. So there's a bit of science behind that as well. But um, yeah, that's kind of how it's gonna be put together. And, uh, and I got approval for that a couple of weeks ago. So now I'm, I'm working on the final piece. I mean, at the moment, I'm actually just cataloging all the stars that I'm gonna light up. Uh, and, and you know, we're trying to decide what magnitude to light up and what what, what not to, and and all that all that jazz. So that's why I'm still I'm still not 100 sure how many there's between 800 to 1,000. I'm quite worked out exactly which ones. I'm still cataloging them, um, but I hope that answers your question. Uh, Heather is asking um, if you said if if it was knitted in panels. Uh, yes, yes, it, it is knitted in panels. Um, so, yeah, so looking back at this screen, um, you, you can kind of see it if you can see my cursor. So this is one panel here, all the way there. And then we've got number two there, three, four, five, six, and then the last one. So that's actually, I was using as many needles as I possibly can to get the maximum width for each panel. So there's about, um, for each piece, 400 needles on the knitting machine, 200 in the front and 200 in the back to produce that width of panel because that's the widest I can get on, on, on the knitting machine and then stitch them all together. Oh, keep those questions coming, people. <laughs> this is just mind-blowing. Yes. Batty, insane. Those are the words I'd use. <laughs> and... Uh, I think Janet is asking uh, how thick it is and how did you have to keep it flat rather than hanging it so it doesn't stretch? Oh, um, so it, it's not very thick. So, um, uh, so, um, so, so if, you can, if you can imagine, I mean, it looks really big when it's all laid out, but if you can imagine just a, a fairly standard size suitcase, it'll, it actually rolls up and fits into a standard size suitcase. So um, it, it's not very thick at all. Um, I, in, in all honesty, it actually spent most of its life uh, so far being rolled up and stuck in a suitcase because I didn't, I didn't really know what to do with it or how to, or how to treat it properly. And then once I got in touch with the, set, with, with the exhibition space in, in the Melbourne CBD and the conservation team were like, so, so how are you storing? And I'm like, oh, it's just in a, folded up in a suitcase. I, I, I got into a lot of trouble because <laughs> they, they want to last a bit longer than that. <laughs> um, so ever since then, I've been laying it flat in my lounge room and it's taking up a, 
obscene amount of MySpace. <laughs> Are you uh, terrified of moss? <laughs> um, uh, I'm not, uh, mostly because I, I know how it's constructed, right? So um, if there was suddenly a hole in it someday, then I can go in and I can actually fix it because I, I understand I, I'm, I'm so used to this pace. I'm working for so long that I know it intimately. Um, so moths don't scare me, but I, I can imagine and they'll probably scare the conservation team when I find my hand over. <laughs> That's a question. How did you um, hear about EMF conference and like what made you want to go to that one? Did you see any others or want to go anywhere else or you had your eye on this one? Yeah, sure. So it, it's a bit of a cultural thing. So I um, uh, I took advantage of the two-year working visa that um, that Australians can do um, or, or can 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 take um, over in the UK. So I was in the UK for a couple of years, and I've always been a bit of a maker. I've always been a tinkerer at heart, and and I love just experimenting lots of different sort of sciences. So um, the I, I got in touch with the London Hackspace guys uh, mostly because I had a, an, an, a domestic knitting machine, and and I, I really wanted to play with one. So they're, they're actually my first introduction to these machines. Um, and I got so involved with, um, you know, with the space and helping out and, and volunteering and doing all the stuff that, um, yeah, by the time my working visa expired, I hadn't really done all that much with it. And I, I was a bit disappointed. So I ended up buying one overseas and bringing it home with me. Um, but I, I talk about London Hackspace. I, I, I absolutely love the group and they're amazing. And, um, yeah, it turns out a lot of the members in the London Hackspace um, were actually organising EMF camp and they're the ones who made, made the whole thing happen. So... Um, yeah, I'm just really familiar with the, the conference itself because I, I know a lot of the people who make it happen and organise it. And um, yeah, it's just a really wonderful um, crowd. And, and I did actually want to mention that um, we, we do have a very similar um, sort of culture here in Australia. We've got the, the Melbourne Hack Space, a group of really great guys and, and girls as well. Um, and, uh, um, and a few other hack spaces. I think there's even three different Melbourne Hack Spaces depending on uh, what part of Melbourne you're in and there's others there's a Sydney hack space too and there's lots of others and um, I, there's also the buzz conf uh, which I think the last one was held in 20 I want to say 2017 I think um, which is very similar it, it, to EMF camp it's um, uh, a, a tech festival where you go and you camp for for a weekend and there's lots of different um, talks and things going on and it's family friendly. And the, the, the industrial knitting machine, do, do you still use that? Uh, the in, industrial knitting machine? Um, the, the one that you knitted the, the sky map on? Oh, yes. Um, yeah, absolutely. It's, it's, um, it's, it's now got its own bedroom dedicated to it. So it's, it's, a, it's a live in resident, permanent live in resident. Um, I, I do do a lot of knitting uh, still. Um, uh, I mean, at the moment, I'm creating this uh, this LED panel that's going to sit behind the tapestry. But I'm also, um, uh, yeah, um, I've, I've got sales on Etsy and that sort of thing that's keeping me very busy. Yeah, yeah. Look, maybe you want to talk a bit about um, your sales on Etsy, your your uh, store on Etsy. I, I clarified with uh, President James, and he said that that's okay to talk about it because uh, we're here to support artists like yourself. <laughs> Okay, yeah, absolutely. So, um, yeah, my Etsy store is just uh, heartofpluto.etsy.com. Uh, I've been selling um, scarves. So uh, that Tessellator rocket scarf, for example, that's available on Etsy as well. Um, I've been doing some uh, uh, geode scarves and that sort of thing. So uh, using rock formations as inspiration for artwork. Um, I've done quite a few different ones in the past. Uh, also um, translating uh, the written word or even programs into an ASCII character lot and then translating those into binary and then from binary into like multicolor artwork. Um, so I like, um, I just did one the other day that was, um, you know, someone saying, I, I love you um, and translated that into a piece of art and they gave that away to, uh, you know, to their partner as a scarf, which is really cool. So I, I do love to work with lots of different ideas and, and I, I can't help but incorporate science into everything I do. So <laughs> it's just my... Where, where, where I, yeah, there's my news. Yeah, and uh, you've also, uh, you've given me a sneak peek of your um, new baby blanket. Ah, yep. Yeah. Uh, I might have to remind yeah, so, me. So the, the astronomical one? Ah, yes. So, um, 
Yeah, so I, I, I do do baby blankets. I think that's probably the, well, the, one of the most popular things that I do. They're, they're customized, so you can have, um, you know, the, the name of your of your baby on the blankets. Uh, let's see if I can actually um, find that for you, Saskia. Uh, let's see, uh, Saskia. So, um, um, yeah, as I mentioned, I purchased one for um, uh, friends, and uh, it, it was a group of us that purchased it for a friend. And to my great disappointment, I yeah I I tried to you know um, to uh, hack the boat, but yeah they chose another design. But yeah, so I was hoping they'd uh, choose um, um, astronomical ones. Yeah yeah so um oh I just say ah oh, there it is okay found it um share my screen again. There we go. Um, so that's these ones. Um, yeah, yeah, those. Yeah, so that, 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 that's an idea kind of around um, uh, taking each of the uh, constellations of the zodiac and associating those with baby's birth dates. Um, you can, it, it's like can't design kind of like a penguin book, book cover. So you've got like you know, a title of the cover, you've got the, the child's name, and then in the background, you've got the, the, um, the constellation uh, or the, the, yeah, the um, star sign that they're born in. I was really having a lot of fun with these. Meryl Streep is apparently a Cancer and <laughs> Michelle Obama is a Capricorn. Um, actually, something I did, I did want to um, ask, ask you guys uh, is that um, uh, this, this piece can still be modified. So I, I have been looking at it really closely. I keep analysing it and there's a few changes I still want to make to it. And I can actually make changes to it even now because... There's a technique um, called uh, embroidery for knitting where you can actually knit over top of existing colours and change the colour and people wouldn't necessarily know, um, you know that, that it, had, it had ever been any different. So, so one mistake in particular that has been annoying me this week, and I, and I think I might go back and change it, is um, uh, Camelopardus. So that constellation, um, the Camelopardus is, is, a British, is an older British name for it, but its true Latin name is Cal Camelopardus. So I think, I feel like, I mean, technically it's accurate, but not as accurate as, um, as perhaps some of the other constellations. So I can actually go back and change the spelling on that. <laughs> so I did want to ask that if anyone had actually spotted any mistakes in there, please do tell me because I can actually fix it. <laughs> so it's, it's that constellation near your hand? Oh, uh, here, uh, yeah. So Cam maybe I can zoom in. Oh, no. uh, Camelopardus. Oh, okay. yeah, yeah. yeah. So Camelopardus is a true name for that constellation. It's an it's a it's an old British name for it, but it's not its Latin name. It's true Latin name is Camelopardalus. So instead of US at the end, it's like A A L U S or something like that. So it's um I, I feel like there's a spelling mistake there. <laughs> Yes, but a, a true piece of art is never finished. <laughs> That's very true. I've definitely not finished this. I keep working on it. I've got to stop. <laughs> but, um, but yeah, it, it, it is interesting to look at in real life because you get the texture of the knitting, um, which is not something you can, you can fully appreciate when you're looking at it in like just in its one big view. Point. So, um, yeah, I do hope that, that some of you will get along to seeing the exhibition. I can't actually, I'm not allowed to give any more details about the exhibition at this stage because the exhibition space, they want full control over advertising. So you, you'll probably hear about it um, uh, perhaps toward later end of this year when they do start advertising. But, um, yeah, when, when, you, when you do see it, I do hope that, uh, that you pop along and, uh, and have a look because it's, um, yeah, taking a few years, but uh, it's nearly there. <laughs> And uh, just remind us again whereabouts it will be. Uh, so it's going to be in an exhibition space. I, I'm not allowed to say exactly where. Oh, okay. and, and yeah. I, I'll share the details when I'm when I'm allowed to do so. But it will be in Melbourne CBD. It'll um, it's an ex exhibition that'll run for a year, and access will be completely free. Excellent. Yeah. Now, yeah. Well, when the time comes, we'll we'll send the gang. <laughs> Excellent. Right, thanks everyone. I, I am conscious that I've taken up about an hour of your time now and I'm supposed to take up half an hour. Oh, that, look, yeah, yeah I, I can hear you speak all evening. <laughs> but no, no, I'm conscious of taking up your time. I'm reminded of the Japanese art and I've forgotten the name of it. It's of uh, filling cracks with gold and treasuring the imperfections that come... Um, 
that just make um, a piece unique and individual. So perhaps you could run gold thread through the name instead. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, I have seen that artwork you mentioned, and, and it is beautiful the way they, they, they take a floor and then they celebrate it because that it, the more floors, the more unique and original that, that piece becomes and the more character it gets. So, yeah, I, um, thank you for reminding me of it, actually. Cool. That's called Fugi. Fugi, yep. Yeah, Fugi, yep. Yes. That's it, F U G I. Yeah. So, uh, any more questions for Sarah? I did notice you put the moon in English. Um, <laughs> apparently, its Latin name is slightly different. <laughs> I that on purpose. <laughs> was it was it Luna said it should be? Yeah. Is that Luna? Oh, there might be a few more changes that uh, you know you're not seeing today that you might see in March next year. <laughs> Very good. What about the sun? I might have to look it up. Yeah. We claim credit for that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I've heard the sun referred to as Sol, S-O-L, though I don't know the details of which of those names you want. <laughs> yeah, I don't know the rules either. But... All right. Thanks, everyone. Thank you so much for having me and it's been fun to, to, to share my passion uh, and talk oh. about it for an hour so. Yeah, yeah I think um, you definitely when um, all the LEDs are complete and we've got a light show, you, you, yeah, yeah, please come back and tell us all about it. Yeah, happy to, yeah. <laughs> Wish me luck, it's, uh, yeah, I, I worked out it's uh, gonna be at least uh, a solid month of, of nine to five soldering. Uh, just on the LED soldering, so soldering, oh. yeah, oh, and that's, that's all. So like cool. just just the soldering is like just a month solid of, of soldering. So <laughs> it's gonna take a while. I love that the combination so cool. of of the art and the tech. It just works for me. It's just so cool. Yeah, I, I've been working really hard to try and um, uh, blur that line between art and tech because I, I find, particularly for school age students, they seem to think that they have to choose between one or the other. And I, I don't think you do. I, I think that there is an art form to tech and I think that there is, you know, technicalities to and a science to some art. It, I, yeah, I think that they really do work together really well. So, um, and you'll see in the exhibition when you, when you pop along to it, that um, it, it really is about blurring that line between art and tech. Mm, yeah, why not both? Yeah, exactly. Why not? Why not? It makes for well-rounded people. I love that. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Big fan. Well-dressed Cylons. <laughs> that? Yeah. No, I can't, can't wait for your next project. <laughs> All right. Thank you very much, guys. Okay. Thank you, Sarah. Thank you, Sarah. Thank you for sharing. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks. I'll stop the recording.